worked as a communications officer, telecommunications, got interested in IT. Uh, my bachelor's degree, though, was in accounting. So I'm not, you know, going to school for accounting initially or anything like that. But after getting out, I took some classes at Kirkwood for network systems, programming databases, and such. And, you know, I worked as an intern, you know, at a network operations center, then for systems, application developer for just over a year, and right now I'm back to being an accountant. So I'm helping my wife out. She had a little bit of a hard time uh, losing a couple of employees, so that's where I'm at right now. So if nothing else, kind of give you guys a little bit of encouragement. You don't have to be the super big IT professional with years of experience to come up and present and kind of, you know, give back to the community. Uh, Bloodhound, Bloodhound AD. Uh, didn't realize that this month, uh, SecDSM was also going to give a talk on Bloodhound AD. They actually had the developers uh, presenting out there. So I presented my talk and I caught off that. So I went and you know watched theirs and stole a few things from them. Um, what I didn't realize presenting this or creating this a few weeks ago was they were going to release Bloodhound 2 two weeks ago. So, you know, being a lazy developer, I'm thinking, you know, what can I, you know, do to get forward with this? And my screen's freezing on me. Yeah, maybe that's not. Let's see if I can restart this. Oh, now it's going all the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm kind of joking there. But yeah, I'll go preach on what I'm 1.5. It's as usual, a developer do it, take the easy route. No, uh, reality, I, I'm going to present a 2.0, I think it's 2.0.3. Um, this presentation is going to be pretty basic. Um, when they gave the presentation at SecDSM, you know, it was a lot about well, what is graph theory, what is Bloodhound. I'm going to cover a little bit about you know Bloodhound, of course, and what it does. I'm going to go a little bit more maybe to the before and after as well. A little bit on the installing of it, maybe a couple of hiccups I had with it, and then I'll try to show you a few things at the end, of course, you know, with what it's like with 2.0. Um, of course, cover who is it for, installation, and then yeah, getting data into it now what. Bloodhound, it's a combination of a bunch of open source things, I guess is the way I'll put it. PowerShell, uh, they use PowerShell largely for gathering the data off the network, talking to the domain controllers, uh, even querying individual computers out there on the network and getting the data for Active Directory. And so I guess I'll start out with who here touches Active Directory, who uses Active Directory, works with it? Okay, so large number, this stuff is for you. Who here? Um, I'll put it this way, who here has ever successfully installed Bloodhound before? I'm not saying you use it regularly. Okay, so a few less of you, but yeah, there's a few of you out there that use it as well. So feel free to chime in if I'm not completely accurate what I say. I want to get the correct information out. I'm not perfect. This is a lot of research and use on my part and what I understand. Um, so PowerShell's used out there to go get that information. You know, Neo4j, that's the database in the background. You know, you might think of, you know, SQL Server or something like that. Well, Neo4j, it's for a graph database. You know, website, web application, you know, JavaScript web app is what's presented. Lingurious is what's kind of presenting that graph database information in an electron, kind of putting it in a GUI window for you. And the purpose, like what Bloodhound really is, is it kind of helps you reveal hidden, unintended relationships in Active Directory, get a better understanding of the relationships there. And what I mean by that is, is you could go and maybe do a query of who's a domain admin, who is this type of admin out there, and it may give you back this user, this user, this user. But what you may be missing is, well, you have these users part of this group, that part of that group that you know has close to these rights of a domain admin. You may not be listing all of you, but you may have someone out there with rights you don't know that they actually have. You start adding users to that group because they need it for that job, but suddenly you give them all these extra rights you didn't realize were there. And then, of course, you know this is being developed by Andy Robbins, Will Schrader, and Rohan Berserker. Kind of explain four. Attackers, yes, they'll use this. They'll use this to try to get information on the network to plan out their attack. How do I become that domain administrator or you know this other you know super admin in a sense um, on the Windows network? But defenders can really use this a lot as well. It shows you what's going on, helps you understand your network, and may help you reorganize it to make it a safer place to be. Keeping this in mind, I'm seeing attackers are using this. This is not a quiet tool. There is a lot of traffic that goes on. If you want this, if you're talking like red team and then you want to be sneaky, I'm like, you're probably going to have to go back to 
you know, simple query stuff being manually done to not get caught. That being said, um, I know Andy was there and he was talking at the presentation. He also said, like, but you'd be surprised at how often, even though maybe the stuff is being monitored, they don't catch it. You know, the logs may be there. Maybe no one's monitoring. Maybe they're monitoring it, but, you know, whatever it is, they can get away with a lot of stuff. Now, uh, I'll throw it out too, just in case so I don't forget later on. There's different options when running Bloodhound and collecting data, and there is a stealth mode. And that stealth mode is something that'll kind of weed out a couple of things that have gotten them in trouble in the past, but it still is a noisy thing. Going on from here, I'm just gonna kind of go into, like I said, start at the beginning, uh, installation. They have really good documentation. This has been out there since DEF CON 24, so about two years now, you know, since they've released it out to the public for use. I tried installing this about two years ago. I was in a database class, so I had learned about Neo4j. So that got me interested. I couldn't get this thing to work. Um, so in two years, one or two things, maybe a little bit of both. The documentation has increased great, or has become much better, and I've learned a lot as well over that time. Um, there's also a lot more videos and things out there, so feel free, you know, go on YouTube, check stuff out, but really their website, their GitHub site is really good. It'll have what you need. For the installation of the main program, and I'll break it into two parts, you'll have that PowerShell script. You'll have that sharpound.exe that you could run on that remote computer on the domain, because the first thing you need is a user account, something on the domain to run with. You gotta be on that domain to get the information, that collects and gathers it. That gives you a set of files you can take back home and put on your computer and put into Bloodhound to look at that info. So first you've got to be on that network, have that user account, grab that info using the ingester, as we'll call it. Once you bring that to your computer, then you can put it on Bloodhound to take a look at what's going on. Bloodhound, what you need for it to work really on your computer is kind of the latest version of Java. If you're using Kali, it's going to be there already, working as it needs to be. You need the Neo4j server installed and running to hold the information. Then you also need, and I guess I really don't have it listed here, is download that compiled executable to run Bloodhound itself. Um, the quantity of the Bloodhound GitHub repo, that's where you'll go and you can get the ingest. <coughs> Now, I kind of left that downloaded that executable uh, install depends on the OS. So Windows, you kind of have to do these things one after another, and you have to do it manually. Um, Kali, though, on the other hand, really if you want the easiest way, you can do apt-get install Bloodhound, it does Neo4j, it does Bloodhound. The thing I ran into is that the last I checked, and that was earlier this week, maybe it's changed recently, is it was like your Bloodhound 1.5. So it wasn't the newest version. To get that newest version, I had to go download the executable and do it. But if you just want to try it for now, and I'm sure Bloodhound 2 will be there eventually if it's not already by the day, really just go to Cali, app get install Bloodhound. You can start playing with it there. There is, yep, exactly what I was talking about. That's the website you go to to download the releases, the executables, and then uh, for me, I'm using Bloodhound, Linux, x64, so. Once you have Bloodhound on your computer in order to run it, um, I don't have the things set up to run automatically, so each time I go to use it, I need to start up Neo4j, get the database server up and going, which is just Neo4j console, and then I can go and run Bloodhound. But the very first time you do it, what you need to remember is that you have to change the password on the database server. If you don't change that password, it's not going to let you use it. So you'll run some issues there. So, to, and I'll run through this. I'm going to kind of go one more time. A little bit of repetition is always good. So when I do the presentation or the live demo in a bit, I'll go through this again. But you just open the web browser. You go to 7474. It's the login for the Neo4j server. You log in the first time. Default credentials: Neo4j, Neo4j. And it'll tell you to change that password right away. You do it. You can close the browser. You can go back to Bloodhound, and you're good to go. Am I going a little fast for anyone either? I'm trying not to fly through this. Sometimes I need to slow down a little. So, like I said, after Neo4j is up and running. I got a question. Yes? So, on that last slide, the idea is that you just keep that window between the, 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 the initial provisioning and changing the paper, and just keep that small. Okay. And that's what you're considering is the app or the system here. Did I understand? 
So in this process, in this step right here, this would be that one-time thing. Um, so after you install Neo4j, Neo4j is the default install. You'd go to this window, go to the HTTP localhost 7474. You know, that's kind of your interface to the database server. Just need to log in that one time and change the password to what you want. And then once you change that password, you're good. You'll use that password later in Bloodhound, but you can actually close that window completely. So I guess, but my question is, is that, is that considered adequate security to have that window of time that the defaults exist before you change them? Is that just a reality? Oh. It is, and if you're really worried about it, you could, you know, at that point also just take it off the network to it. Just do it on local machine. Yeah, it, it's just this literally is on your local machine that you'll be doing this. So when you install Neo4j, it's on your local machine. The only thing that ever happens on, you know, an attack machine or, you know, if you're a blue team, you know, on the network is you're running that sharphound.exe. So, yeah. I mean, if you're attacking a computer and you're remotely, you know, using that or something, like you send that file over, run it, you delete it, but, you know, pull back the results, and then nothing left on that computer except for your cleanup. So, now that you have Neo4j running, uh, you just go in. Uh, if you've downloaded that executable, you go in the directory and run it from there. If you get the app get installed, you can just run it from a terminal, just type blood down and it'll go. Uh, I have had a few hiccups where some reason it'll bring it up, especially in the 1.5, like a gray screen, a couple times in depth two that it'll just be a gray, it won't give me a login, I can't, I don't know what's going on, it just sits there. Uh, control R will do a refresh and then you just bring it right back up. Um, then when you load up Bloodhound, it'll of course ask your credentials to log in, to log into that uh, Neo4j server. It already is great in there. You may have to type it, but it'll tell you, oh, cool, you know, 1.7001 with the port number 7687. You may just have to type the stuff in, it'll present it to you, so it's a little easy to remember. The only thing you really have to remember is what did you change that password to? Now that you have Bloodhound up and running, uh, you've downloaded the code, so if you download, like I said, the Bloodhound ID, Bloodhound, GitHub repo, now's the time, it's up and running on your local machine, you need to go out and you know, try to get the data off the network. So, clone it and you can get the ingesters by going to that Bloodhound folder, the folder is called ingesters, and I typically use shopround.exe. There's also a PowerShell file that you can use, um, but they do the same thing. I'm gonna show this here uh, tonight just with connectivity time's sake. I'm not gonna go and run this on a remote computer. I don't have Active Directory or something here to go use with this, but this is what it'll look like when you run it. Um, you know, just, you get it there, you run sharpon.exe, and what I'll point out is I typed clutch in method, so minus minus clutch in method all, and that's to kind of go through everything. If you just run sharpound.exe, it'll do a collection, but it won't necessarily collect everything. I can't remember exactly what it does and what it doesn't, but I usually run collection method all, collect everything, except, I'll, I'll get into it in the documentation a little bit, but it collects most everything, that way I make sure I get all those sessions, the ACLs and everything I'm looking for. And the result, and this has changed a little bit, after you run sharpound, in 1.5, you're left with a list of CSV files. And you'd have to bring approximately six of them back. Uh, with version two, they now have it where they automatically take those CSV files, they set them up for you, leaves you with that one file. Makes it a lot easier, a lot quicker to move that file to where you need. Once you get those CSV files back to your local machine, then go into the spot on the right that I showed there, you can click upload data, select the file, and pull up, or select the CSV files, and then pull them in. Uh, one of the nice improvements they made for or Bloodhound 2 was you could just drag and drop. You drag it to that screen, you let go, it brings it right in, much simpler. And there's a lot of really nice things they did with version 2 that we had to. Once you have the information in there, um, yeah, let's go to the PSC link, come out of um, you can click that upper left corner menu and it'll drop it down. And then there's the three tabs. And that far right tab are just some default queries. 
that you can go and select. You can go further, you can kind of see it on the bottom of the screen, it's cut off, it shows on mine. Uh, it says raw query. The language that they use is Cypher. So there are other Cypher queries, other things you can do if you want to get to learn the language. Right now, I'm just sticking with the default queries. What you see up there right now, though, is from 1.5, and I'll show you in a bit what's in version 2. Here's a couple of slides. This is the first of two, anyways, that uh, features they brought in. Uh, probably a little hard to see from back there, but some of the biggest things they have were the ability to add, edit, and remove edges and nodes, or edges and vertices, I guess would be the proper terms for that. So vertices could be like a computer or a user. The edge would be the relationship to it. So like this user can RDP to this computer, or this user is an admin to this computer. So in the past, you could do that, but you'd have to do a bit of a Cypher query. You'd have to type out that query. Um, they made it much simpler. Now you just click it, right, or right click it, and select what you want to do. Or if you want to add something, you right click the general background, add, and you can just start typing in information. They made it much simpler. Um, they also added a dark mode. They added nodes. They, of course, did some general improvements to the efficiency of what's going on. Uh, for the sharp pound side of it, the ingester half, um, like I said, they defaulted the output to zip. They also added an encrypt zip, zip file name, and a few others. Um, performance improvements are in there, and then they rewrote the output to JSON. And then I'm just sort of here, I'm getting toward the end of the presentation for my live demo. Just a few of the, good, the links I found helpful. Um, they have their getting started. They've got another section on you know, data collection and intro and how to go through that, as well as the data collector. And then if you're interested in that Cypher query language and learn a bit more of that, at least on the intro side, um, I have a link at the bottom for that. And that's just kind of a summary of what I've covered so far, and I'm about to go into the demo. But before I go into the demo, do I have any more questions? Yes. So if I was going to defend against it, I mean, you said it was noisy. Does that kind of create like event IDs and uh, link stores and all the endpoints themselves, you know? Or where would I monitor for that? A lot of it, it creates shit tons of 445 traffic in your network. So if you have yeah. NetFlow yeah. and you see uh, yeah. lots of chatter on that, uh, I, I've seen it get caught uh, cost when you cross firewalls a lot. Okay. I'm trying to think of how they explain that answer too. And then it, it, a lot of the stuff, it, what it's doing, I mean, they're taking PowerShell queries to the Active Directory server. They're, this is like a legit thing, you know, it's, it's there to give out that info. You know, for legitimate reasons all the time, and one of the things they're looking for is like, well, if you start having a server getting like request after request after request, like, you know, this huge amount of, you know, requests coming from, like, say, a single computer, like, something's up, something's up. That's not just a normal, you know, getting just one piece of information. You should be uh, logging how much you want to I'm not going to run through this again. I just kind of threw up a couple of tabs of the things, like I said. So, I mean, if I was going to install Neo4j, just go in, app get install Neo4j. Um, even before some of these tabs, I'm going to kind of go through the install. The stuff that I already put on here, because it's Kali Lite, it, I mean, I made sure Git was on there, Python pip, unzip Neo4j is what I'm going through. And there's also one thing uh, I'm going to show you. One of the Bloodhound tools, so there's a repo for Bloodhound. There's also another repo, Bloodhound tools. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot there, but one of the tools that they have is kind of a random data generator. So it'll generate, you know, these 500 users and things like that. So you have like this nice size data set to use to practice and do things with on Bloodhound. Um, to get that up and working, it, it threw an error at me. So there is a live G comp 2 minus 4 that I had to install. Same thing, I can install that. Once I did that, it was good to go. So, as I said, you know, in the beginning, install, installing that, kind of the cloning, 
the two repos, the main Bloodhound one and then the Bloodhound tools, pull that stuff in. Then I also had to go into, for those tools, install the new 4J driver. And I'm going to kind of back out of this, you know, just as a good lesson. If, who here has done much with programming in Python before? Is there, maybe people mess with that much? A few? If you're sitting there downloading it, one of the things I always recommend is make sure you look at the documentation. And for scripting languages like Python, that's usually at the top of the file. So, I got Bloodhound tools right here. Let's see how well this shows up. So if I go into it, there's the DB creator. So that's the Python script. Oh god, that's gonna be small. And I don't know if I can necessarily make this big. Yeah, I don't know if that makes sense or not. Okay, I'm just gonna read this for simplicity state. But at the top it says requirements. Pip install Neo4j driver. So it kind of told me in there, oh, that's something else I need to install to make it work. And it also goes through the different commands, you know, of database config, connect, set nodes, clear DB, generate, you know, clear and generate. So the different things I can do with this, whether I need to just, well, of course, first need to connect to the, the database before I can do anything with it, then if I'm just going to generate or if I need to clear the data there, then generate. Um, and stuff's not any different for Bloodhound as well. On the right folder. If I go into the ingesters and take a look at their PowerShell file, you're not going to be able to see this very well as well, but I'll kind of read it now. But it goes through, and the collection methods, they have a whole group for them. So whether it's group, local, admin, RDP, so on, but even at the bottom, it says all. And the two things it doesn't really do is it collects everything but the GPO local group and logged on. So just something to keep in mind there. But the information's there for you. So yeah, you can sit there and Google all day, you know, what it is, how do I use it. But if you take a quick look at the script itself, a lot of times it'll tell you what you need to know. So I mean then going into it for me to actually go and run it, Neo4j console. I'll give it a second, and then usually they'll kind of say that it started up or it has something listening on the local host, you know, port 7474. And I know once it hits that spot, that that's a good time for me to go switch to the web page and change my password. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind, too, for that DB tool to create um, that practice set, uh, you can do it from there's like a configure spot where you can configure like what is the username, password, and so on, or you can just edit the script directly. I just have the script already set up to go. So as I said, it's at, okay, 7687. I know. Well, that's, that's not 7687. Well, it will be. 7687 is what, that'll be what Bloodhound will connect to to talk to the database. There it is. It's just common. So there's a few different things you can do with the database, but what I need in order to change the password is to go to 7474. And like I said, this is just what you're going to do the first time to go set the password. See if the demo guys are next to me. There it is. There we go. Can you enlarge it? You're welcome. Okay. So again, new for J. Connect. That's gonna have to be a new password. <laughs> Careful. Yeah, <laughs> everyone's gonna. That's okay. I'm doing this VM as soon as I'm on here today. Anyway, so. Okay. So once I'm there, I've got the password changed. I'm in the directory where I unzip the binaries. So I can go run Bloodhound. It should just take a second and it'll pop up the window.
As far as issues around Bloodhound or crash or anything like that, I haven't had any issues running it with normal data. I will throw it out that I have had it when I've done the generated data at times. For some reason, I'll choose like a user or a computer and will just lock up and close out on me or blank out and I gotta refresh the screen. So that is a possibility again, but I've never had it happen with actual live data. So logging in, it's there. I can bring it down. And the database info, of course, it's just a big empty database at this time. So I'm going to minimize this for a, time, a second. And then I'm going to go in and get some data generated. Let's see if I can remember what it is. OK. So now that I'm in that DB creator you know, menu, it's just going to be as simple as a Python script running Python with DB creator. It automatically comes up with the help listing off. Yeah, I really just cut off a little bit of it. But clear generates the first one, clear DB, connect, and so on. You know, since I'm going to connect, I'm going to connect to it. Um, first time going to it, you can type config, and this is where I said you can do it from here from within the scripts. So 7687, you know, for J. So you're going to see what I changed the password to because I just kept it to what it was by default from what they created and so on. I forget what it is, help again. But um, at this point, I still should be created or connected and I should just be able to generate because there's nothing there to do. See if any errors happen. If they do, I'm going to clear and regenerate it. So, for those that have used this before, uh, what have you used it for? I mean, has it been a blue team, red team, or? Red team. Red team? Red team. Red team. Anyone used it for blue team yet, or just for, I mean, just general sysadmin and see how things are? How's it worked on Red Team? Great, great, great. <laughs> okay, has anyone heard of anything like automating stuff with this? So, uh, I'm trying to think of what the two things were. It was like Death Star and Go Fetch have been thrown out in the past, or? Death Star works with Empire. Yep. It used to, I think someone threw it out, like they did try it with one how maybe one time, and they changed it over to Empire, what they use. And Eric Schrader is also like, one of the developers for Empire. He's a one of the free developers for Bloodhound. This is taking a lot longer than normal. Um, the only thing I would throw up Go Fetch is I looked at it too. That was something else mentioned at SecDSM, but I haven't seen anything for commits on their GitHub site since like June of last year. So it seems like it's got a little stagnant. And yeah, who's this should hopefully not take. It just takes a couple of seconds. Well, let's just see what's in there. Okay. Well, let's we'll see if any of those errors cause any issues. But as you can see, if I go back and refresh, instead of all zeros, I have some data there right now. Can you admire that? Yes, definitely. Well, maybe. <laughs> I probably cannot. Let's see. What's that? I, I don't know. Okay. For right now, I can't. I can read the numbers off if you'd like, but it just basically gets a death. <laughs> I've never seen that before. <laughs> it's just you can't read it. Yeah, tell me about it. Okay, let's try this one more time.
residence in Harrison City. Okay, thank God. Yay. Okay. We've got no info on queries. So I'm, I'm going to go into queries. Um, they've changed up a little bit. I guess one of the ones I'm going to do is say shortest, let's see. Shortest path to domain admins from, or shortest path, here we go, to high value targets. Select my domain, and it should start querying through everything and bring it up. Let's see how well this shows up. This time. So there's kind of an idea of what it will look like with about 500 nodes. You can zoom in as well, and then at times they may group something. And if they do, you should be able to right click it and have an option to come out. If you're sitting here looking and you start highlighting something, okay, that's that computer, it starts showing you kind of that attack path to get up to domain admin. Um, kind of as I was showing before, if you right click it, they have options now that you can start mark a computer as own. Okay, so if that's a computer I own, if maybe this is a user is owned, and maybe this computer up here is one that's also owned, then I might be able to go use something else to where I'll look at shortest path to domain admin from own principle. And it'll quit looking at everything else, but based on what I own, what I have rights to, it should show us how those paths to domain admin from those users. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I haven't seen that one before. That never stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Well, someone who's used this a lot more than I has done this before telling me what I'm doing wrong, but. Yeah, I've never. I've, <laughs> I'm just using their default query, so this should not be. Okay. But still, Yeah. Oh. I guess. Why? Let's try this one more time. Well, you saw the little blood, and he was toast running. Okay, I was going to say, it should not take that long. So there would be the three principles and kind of the path you would have to take to get there. I'm not going to get a detail on all the other ones, but you can, you know, add a node, start adding the node information, what type of node it is, add edge, that's the relationship, so you'll pick on that start and end point. And a lot of these edges are very one way. You have this, you know, and you're saying you're an admin to something else, or you can RDP to something. Um, what I would throw out too is that a lot of times in the past with Bloodhound, it, the focus has really been about what have people been enamored to. Um, what they're finding more and more is as they lock those types of things down, um, RDP is kind of becoming a bigger thing. Uh, they're really noticing since they've added that RDP too, that they found a lot more ways that you could get into becoming a domain admin that they weren't using before. Yes? In the previous map, the dashed line? Yeah. I'm just going to go back yeah. to from this. No, from last, last, uh, the whole 500. See if I can. So at the top of the Oh, like right here? Yeah. That one is a GP link, is what that's stating. GP link is what the words love it stay. Um, it's connected in default domain controllers policy to domain controllers. So what's the difference? Is it a physical? No, it's a group policy object, I'm guessing, right? So it's policy. Oh, okay. uh, I'm not familiar with it, so I was going to. And I guess my second question is that these are all. These are all physical connections, not logical. This is just. No, these are logical. 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 It's just logical. Yeah, so there's Sorry. endpoints and machines and then users and groups. Yep. Yeah. 
And if you select a user, you can go to node info. You know, from there you can select to see if there's explicit admins and enrolled admins. So explicit stuff that directly assigned to enroll might be where they're part of a group, part of a group. If you really want to get into it, you just hover right over and you see it turn to the hand and click it. Well, it doesn't necessarily realign the best, but I can see for that one, okay, ITO263, you know, ITO19, it's just the different groups, domain admins. If I go into the unrolled, it's those same four, but it'll start unrolling to the users within them. That kind of helps give you a better visualization of what I mean by it. Um, but other than that, and that concludes my presentation, but are there any other questions? Thank you.